chairman. Prior to his appointment at the district court, he was a litigator in private practice, most recently as a partner at Reed Smith. Uh, he is an undergraduate, uh, he had his undergraduate degree from Notre Dame, his law degree from Georgetown Law, and still teaches a, a one-week course at Georgetown Law uh, involving the First and Second Amendments, which uh, given my interest, I may have to go audit. Um, <laughs> but without further ado, um, I will give you Judge Hardiman, and uh, thank you and welcome to our panel. Thank you, Eric. Um, we've got folks coming from a very good panel that just ended. There are still some seats up front if, if people uh, don't want to stand. Uh, on this Veterans Day celebration, my thoughts turn to all those who have served, especially those who gave their last full measure of devotion to our country. So I'd like to start by honoring them with a moment of silence. Thank you. We're fortunate to have five distinguished panelists today. Their numerous accomplishments are listed on the convention website, so I will introduce them only briefly to save us time. Michael Domino, to my immediate left, is a professor of law at Widener University Commonwealth Law School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He has written extensively on constitutional law and election law. If I need help adjudicating any disputes this afternoon, I may call on Professor Domino because he has experience as a baseball umpire and a hockey referee. Michael Adams, next to him, is Secretary of State of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Before assuming public office, Secretary Adams had a national practice in election law and was general counsel to the Republican Governors Association. My favorite fun fact about Secretary Adams is, like me, he's first generation college. Richard Brefault is the Joseph R. Chambers, Chamberlain, excuse me, professor of legislation at Columbia Law School. He's the law school's leading authority on state and local government law. Professor Brefault has written or co-authored over 90 publications and has written extensively on preemption and campaign finance issues. He's also very active with the American Law Institute where he has served as a reporter there. Next to him is Bradley Smith, the Josiah Blackmore and Shirley Nault Professor of Law at Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio. He's the author of three books on election law and voting rights. For five years during the George W. Bush administration, Professor Smith served as commissioner of the Federal Election Commission and was its chairman elected in 2004, or perhaps appointed, actually. Uh, I stand corrected if that's the case. Uh, finally, last but not least, Richard Pildes is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at New York University Law School. A specialist in legal issues affecting democracy, he authored a case book called The Law of Democracy, Legal Structure of the Political Process. Professor Pildes has won two cases in the United States Supreme Court and has served as senior legal advisor to both of Barack Obama's successful presidential campaigns. Now we're going to begin in the usual manner with opening statements from each of our panelists, approximately five to seven minutes, and then I'll seek reaction and commentary from the panelists on what they've heard from others. And of course, we will conclude at the end with questions from the audience. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Domino. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Judge Hardiman. Thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting the panel and for inviting all of us. It really is an honor to be here, particularly with uh, such esteemed panelists. Before you rely on me to decide cases, though. You might want to ask the opinion of some of the fans and parents who watch the games that I officiate. <laughs> when Justice Scalia was defending originalism, he would readily concede that originalism wasn't perfect. It created all kinds of problems, required judges to be 
more or less amateur historians. It required reading into a vague historical record. It produced policy results that might seem unpalatable to modern ears, etc. But he said, the question of what kind of methodology to adopt was not whether originalism was perfect, but whether it was better than the others. And as long as, in his view, originalism beat the alternative, well, that was the way to go. And it kind of reminds me of my father's parenting philosophy, which made quite clear to my brother and me that any kind of complaint about the way things were was likely to result in an outcome that was worse than what we were complaining about. <laughs> and so I want to focus your attention on the, the panel description, which asks uh, what it means to have a fair election process and how much deference judges should pay to the determinations of officials whose actions in formulating and applying election laws may have partisan motivations. Now, it's quite clear that deference to political officials who make political decisions, seemingly for political reasons, presents substantial dangers for the electoral process and for the judicial process as a whole. So it seems like the answer should be intuitively obvious. To what extent should we defer to these people in making political decisions when we're on the courts? Well, obviously not at all, right? Well, maybe. Let me give you some reasons for pause. That is, before we criticize the actions of the political officials and think that judges can do better, let's make sure that judges can do better. And if we're not sure, then as imperfect as it is, maybe having these kinds of decisions made by political officials, maybe that's the best we can do, or at least tolerable. Now, I want to, uh, I want to begin by uh, letting you remember constitutional law in law school. When you learned the rational basis test, and you studied cases like Williamson versus Lee Optical, or Railway Express versus New York, or Caroline Products, or whatever, you learned that there's a very strong principle of deference that courts will apply to certain kinds of political decisions or decisions by political actors. The reason for that was not always, or maybe even usually, that the political actors would come out with the right decision. Instead, it was a question of institutional competence. It was, if we, the judges, decide this question instead, we to do any better. Maybe we'll do worse. But even if the quality of the judicial choice is acceptable, the biggest problem with having judges decide these kinds of political questions is that it risks undermining the support for the judiciary by saying the judges are going to make determinations on the basis of their own political philosophies. It's one thing for the public to look at members of the legislature, members of the executive branch, even some secretaries of state and say, oh, well, there are political consequences of your decisions and maybe I'm a little suspicious about the reason why you're choosing to affect this policy over this other one. Maybe you're really doing it to advantage the political party that you favor. Well, big deal. Who cares if the legislature is, uh, members of the legislature are believed to be acting for political reasons. We all know that they're acting for political reasons. That's not anything that's going to undermine the American uh, uh, electoral process or our faith in the system. On the other hand, if judges are believed to be acting for political reasons, then that is a substantial threat to the public's esteem for the judiciary. Now, I don't favor deference to political actors for every kind of decision. 
Justice Frankfurter famously said in his dissent in Baker versus Carr, there is, uh, there is not under our Constitution a judicial remedy for every political mischief. And that's right, but it doesn't mean that under our Constitution there is no judicial remedy for any political mischief. I certainly believe that judges should act strenuously to defend, uh, to defend the Constitution, to defend constitutional rights that are explicit in the Constitution. However, the difference between the kinds of situations where judges are likely to get into trouble and those where they are not is the specificity with which the judges are applying rules, the specificity of the rules that the judges are applying. If the courts can point to specific rules, that is, ones that are judicially discernible in the Constitution and manageable according to the judicial process, if the courts can point to those kinds of standards, then they're likely to be on solid ground. It is most problematic when the courts can rely on nothing other than their sense of fairness. If the choice in a, in a decision comes down to the judge's view of political fairness versus the politician's view of political fairness, then I don't think that there's enough justification for the judges to get involved. And very briefly, I know I don't have much time left, but I'll wrap it up with, uh, with three recent cases by the US Supreme Court that I think demonstrate this potential problem. A few years ago in Rucho versus Common Cause, the Supreme Court decided that there were no judicially manageable standards for deciding partisan gerrymandering cases. And it seemed like the Supreme Court viewed the, its entry into election law as governed by that kind of, uh, of restraint, if you want to call it that. We won't get involved unless we have a judicially discoverable and manageable standard for resolving a controversy. Yet this past term, the Supreme Court decided two election cases where it not only allowed for a standard that was not judicially manageable, but the court went out of its way to create an unmanageable standard and not even resolve what it was. The two cases are Moore versus Harper, the uh, independent state legislature theory case, and Allen versus Milligan, a voting rights case out of Alabama. We don't have enough time to get into the details of what they are. Uh, the Milligan case, uh, but so I'll describe them only briefly. The Milligan case involved the creation of a second majority minority district in Alabama, and the question was when that would be required. The court said, well, you don't have to give minorities proportional representation, but if you can give them proportional representation without uh, undermining the compactness of districts, then, for all intents and purposes, you have to. Well, the court gave us no measure of compactness, didn't tell us how much compactness was necessary or good. Uh, it created this standard without giving us much of a, an indication as to how to apply it in the future. And in Moore versus Harper, the court said that in general, the state supreme courts can exercise judicial review over decisions of state legislatures, that is the state legislatures don't have the unreviewable authority to determine the times, places, and manner of congressional elections. But if the state courts go too far, if they go beyond exercising ordinary judicial review, the court said, then they, the uh, state courts will have usurped the legislature's authority and will have violated the US Constitution. As to what ordinary judicial review meant, the court acknowledged that it was uh, a vague concept, wasn't resolving what it, mean, what it meant, didn't even decide on a standard. It sort of suggested here are three possibilities for a standard, but we don't need to resolve it now. And so uh, everybody in the, in the academy and elsewhere are left to figure out what it means. Now when the court comes back to that decision, it's of course going to be in the middle of a hotly contested election Perhaps the outcome is going, to is going to depend on which standard the court applies, and the court is going to be right back into being attacked for choosing winners, just like it was attacked during Bush versus Gore. If you don't want the court to be perceived as a political institution, then don't make decisions based on your own view of political theory.
Thanks very much. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Federal Society, for this invitation, and uh, thank you, Kentucky voters, for sparing me a statewide recount this week so I could be here today. <laughs> uh, I'd like to give you my take on what it's like to be a state's chief election official in these times. My assessment is relatively less scholarly, but I'll try to compensate by giving you a sense of what it's like to be in this job and some lessons I've learned that I'd like others to learn. When I first ran for Secretary of State four years ago, my biggest challenge was explaining to voters what the office even did. I don't have that problem anymore, <laughs> nor do I think my colleagues in other states do. Because of 2020 and its wake, this office is far more prominent. I think that's a good thing. This office is important, and more scrutiny means more voter awareness and more public accountability. Another difference is now candidates for this office are less likely to be non-ideological bureaucrats like county clerks and more likely to be ideologues like me. <laughs> I've practiced election law for Republican candidates and causes for 20 years and I'm the first Secretary of State candidate in my state's history to have run on a policy platform. Photo ID to vote, post election audits, cleaning up the voter rolls and so forth. In Michigan and Colorado, the secretaries of state are young progressive activists who ran ideological campaigns about voting rights. I like the fact that voters now have clear choices in these races, but the cost of that is that there is some tension among us. And the National Association of Secretaries of State risks looking like the US House of Representatives. <laughs> Let me turn here to a point about ideology. I'm a red-blooded conservative, and this is not my first FedSoc conference. I was elected on photo ID and I pushed it through our legislature in the spring of 2020 at the zenith of COVID panic at a time government offices weren't even open. I did that to keep my campaign promise, but also to hold my base together while I innovated with voting methods during the pandemic. Most of the problems I face in doing my job though are practical, not ideological. It's getting harder to get poll workers, partly because of the mistreatment they now get but mostly because there's been a decline in volunteering generally. It's harder to get voting locations too, partly because of the controversy around voting, partly because the Biden administration has recklessly stepped up enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act against county election officials who are trying in good faith to offer as many voting locations as they can. Many of the thousands of buildings we use were built before 1990. They don't have ramps, or they have parking lots across, uh, across a gravel road, et cetera. This administration, rather than working with us in good faith to find alternative locations, has compelled that we simply close locations. In my state, at least, it is not conservatives who are engaged in voter suppression. To address the appropriate level of deference courts should give people like me, instinctively, I would say a lot, but I'll try to be objective. I get sued every day and twice on Sunday. Outside a presidential election, most of these lawsuits are bona fide challenges over candidate residency, qualifications, use of name on the ballot, and so forth. Presidential years are different. In the Trump and Dobbs era, the left has unlimited cash. They can and do throw teams of expensive lawyers at me and my state, even though we haven't voted for a Democrat in a statewide federal race in this millennium. It's self-serving to say judges should butt out and let me do my job, but I think that's generally right, so long as I'm following the law. One, judges are not subject matter experts in election administration. They're jacks of all trades and masters of none, as they should be. Two, I'm directly accountable to the electorate for my performance in a way that judges are not. Three, I think it hurts public confidence in the elections to have judges make up election rules on the fly rather than follow the normal process that separation of powers would dictate. Judges should not hesitate to smack the hands of election officials who stray from their oath to follow the law, but they should hesitate to start making the law themselves. <laughs> 
I personally think that judicial activism did more in 2020 to undercut public faith in our elections than drop box mules or 3 a.m. ballot dumps ever did. A final point, Kentucky has shown as we've expanded voting days from one to four during my tenure, but also stepped up voter ID and purged hundreds of thousands of people off our voter rolls who had moved away or passed away or been put away, we've proved that you can have access and integrity at the same time. I encourage conservatives to never go wobbly on election integrity, but you can make it easier to vote while you make it harder to cheat. It's the right thing to do and you avoid feeding into the left's fallacious argument that we are trying to rig the results. Thank you. Oh, great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, this is my first visit to the Federal Society, so um, I'm not quite Daniel in the lion's den, but I am interested to in see how this goes, but I'm delighted that I have several former students here, starting with Eric, who began, and, and then it also goes to Brad, so I've got like several generations of students here, so which, is, which has been a, a pleasant uh, discovery. Um, I guess you've now heard a little bit of perspectives about court's role and administrator's role. My comments are gonna focus mostly on developments in state election law, on the conflicting partisan perspectives they provide on our election system and its problems. Recent years have witnessed frequent changes in state election law. This dates back to the 2000s, but accelerated dramatically after the 2020 election. 2021 witnessed more changes in election laws, laws dealing with election administration, voter registration, and the balloting and tabulation processes than any year in recent history, with 2023 being a close second. Many of these changes reflect what different partisan and ideological groups determined were the lessons of the 2020 and 2022 elections. I tempted to say the tale of two cities, the tale of two sets of states. Our, two, our state laws are begin Kentucky, I think, is a, is a, is a counterexample, but are moving in different directions. In the so-called blue states, legislatures have acted to make registration and voting easier. 24 states now offer automatic voter registration. 22 of those states went for Biden in 2020. 21 states now have some form of same day or election day registration. The partisan divide is less sharp for these, only 15 went for Biden, but some of the six red states that have same day registration have recently begun to adopt measures making it less available. Uh, blue states have also liberalized voter ID requirements, enabling more kinds of ID to count, building on the dramatically increased level of early in-person and mail vo voting and mail-in voting during the pandemic. Blue states have increased the availability of both. More states now authorize no excuse absentee voting on a permanent basis, where it existed only in 2020 on an emergency basis or facilitate it where it previously existed, such as by giving voters more time to request and return mail ballots and expanding the availability of drop boxes. Similarly, responding to the incidents of harassment, stalking, vandalism, and threats against election workers in the aftermath of the 2020 election and again in 2022, 11 states, 10 blue, have adopted new protections for election workers, including the privacy of their personal information. Red states, and I'm obviously using these as generalizations, as revealed by the laws that they have been adopting, see the lessons of 2020 and 2022 and the problems of election administration differently. Red states have been shortening early voting periods, imposing stricter voter ID requirements, both for in-person voting and vote by mail, shortening the period, not all red states are doing everything, but these are common patterns, shortening the period to request mail ballots, barring election workers from sending unsolicited absentee ballot applications or ballots, moving up the return date for mail ballots, imposing new requirements and penalties on voter registration organizations, expanding the access and observation rights of poll watchers. It's obviously important to distinguish between poll workers and poll watchers, and imposing new requirements often backed up with criminal penalties on election workers, including penalties for mistakes. Uh, further underscoring the distrust of local admin election administration, uh, 10 states with Republican trifecta governments have increased the ability of state administrative takeovers of local elections offices. I think the two clearest differences or directions in which I think red states are going uh, deal with the acceptance of private or philanthropic contributions and the regulation of drop boxes. Uh, in the, maybe the clearest response to 2020 is that over the past three years, none of these states had rules on this before, 25 states, uh, including only four that voted for Biden and two of those have Republican trifecta governments, have passed constitutional amendments for laws 
banning or tightly limiting the solicitation, acceptance or use of private or philanthropic support for election operations. This is obviously a reaction to the grants from the Zuckerberg Chan Center for, t uh, C Center for Tech and Civic Life, which provided tens of thousands of millions of dollars actually to local elections offices to handle the unanticipated expenses due to COVID-19 for PPE and cleaning supplies in bigger places and obviously handling the surge in mail ballots. Uh, local elections offices are chronically underfunded. Um, taking away funding without providing funding is a recipe for difficulties on election day. Uh, that same COVID-driven surge in vote by mail has triggered a, a move by many red states to make uh, to require photo, photocopies of ID or notary signatures with ballot applications. But most strikingly is the move to ban drop boxes. 12 states now ban them. 11 states require, uh, 11 states that carried by Trump on the 12th, Wisconsin was due to a state court decision. And five more states now tightly restrict their use, such as having one drop box per county, regardless of the population of the county. It's kind of funny, as a matter of ballot security, this is somewhat ironic given that drop boxes can actually be monitored and provided with anti-tampering devices and secure pickups more effectively than ordinary postal boxes. And indeed, uh, voters seem to prefer uh, drop boxes to ordinary mailboxes. Perhaps the most striking development has not come into law, but thus is an initiative that's being pushed by um, county governments and individual legislatures, which is the call for hand counting of ballots. Uh, this has come up. This has triggered direct conflicts between state and local officials in Arizona and Nevada, there's been a call for it in New Hampshire, and very recently, currently really in California, where the state just banned hand counting of ballots in elections in any community with more than 1,000 registered voters, and Shasta County, which has about 100,000 people, canceled this contract for voting machinery and wants to use a hand count. Um, obviously, there's a deep distrust of the election machinery out there that's, that's triggering this, but, this was, but the implausibility, if not the impossibility, uh, of hand counting ballots in any sizable jurisdiction was demonstrated by a test run by Mojave County, Arizona, where it took seven part-time and four full-time election workers, three eight-hour days to count just 100, 850 ballots, and they made 46 errors. <laughs> so um, I know they're uh, interesting. The call for hand counting is really quite strong out there, but it does seem to be uh, an unwise move. Uh, what people don't realize is that most ballots have multiple votes. So the 850 ballots in Mojave County had actually more than 30,000 votes given the multiple number of offices that are running. Another area where there's been a partisan divide seems to me is to have much less of a partisan valence, uh, but nonetheless is striking, and that is uh, rules dealing with ranked choice voting. Uh, that to me has no inherent partisan valence. It was used statewide in Red Alaska and by many local governments in Red Utah, uh, but perhaps because it led to the election of a moderate Republican and a Democrat in Alaska, the expansion of ranked choice voting has occurred only in blue states, with five states, all red, uh, adopting laws just in the last two years, 2022 and 2023, prohibiting ranked choice voting in state or local elections. So I think what you do see is obviously these different patterns. Final thought, uh, whatever the ideology underlying particular law, election law changes, the proliferation of new rules and requirements is itself a burden, I think to our 8,000 or more overworked, underfunded, and frequently embattled local election offices. Election offices, I think, election workers are the essential workers of the political system. I like to think of Secretary Adams as like the, the chief of surgery in the ER uh, of our election system, but we also have to think about the lower level workers as well. Recent years have witnessed, as he already alluded to, a high level of turnover in local elections offices and the departure through retirement, resignation, or removal of many senior local election officials, that itself is likely to lead to more mistakes and conflicts in the electoral system, which in turn will undermine public faith in the electoral system and will no doubt lead to further election law changes that local officials will have to deal with. Okay, well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Judge Hardiman, and thanks for my, my fellow panelists, and as always, to the Federalist Society. In, so in recent years, we've seen a large and apparently growing percentage of Americans who are simply unwilling to accept that an election lost by their preferred candidates was an honest result. I don't mean here people who believe that the election wasn't fair in the sense that the media was one-sided or that one candidate was able to spend far more money than the other, but rather 
uh, and a great many people note such facts, but I mean people who uh, specifically believe that the campaign was not merely unfair, but that the announced results were fraudulent, the result of fraudulent voting, fraudulent machines, or, or fraudulent officials in some way. Um, because of the widespread belief among Republican voters that the 2020 election was fraudulent and the ongoing high visibility of Donald Trump in making that claim, there's been a rise in the belief in, in intellectual and academic circles that this is a uniquely Republican slash conservative problem. In fact, I want to emphasize that this is a bipartisan problem. For example, in 2018, a Gallup poll found that 78% of Democrats believe that Trump stole the 2016 election with Russian assistance. And this is a higher total of election deniers than I have ever seen in any poll of Republicans based on the 2020 election. Even today, seven years after the 2016 election, without so prominent a figure as Mr. Trump constantly banging the drum of fraud, and with the balm of holding presidential power, uh, polls regularly find that over 50% of Democrats still believe that Trump did not win the 2016 election. Overall, roughly two-thirds of Americans, uh, some possibly as many as three-quarters, now seem to believe that in at least one of the last two elections, the winner was cheated out of victory through some type of fraud. Now my point here is not to really say who is worse or what is worse or how people reacted or what they're saying publicly or who had what evidence on their side. It's simply to emphasize that the issue here is bipartisan. I don't believe that democracy can continue long if large segments of our population simply do not accept announced election results as honest. Now briefly on the political right, the typical cry has been fraud, while on the left it's vote suppression. These beliefs, in my view, are both almost entirely disconnected from the facts. By almost any standard, fraud in American elections is relatively trivial and less common than it has been throughout much of our history. And contrary to claims of suppression, there have never been fewer obstacles to voting in the United States. Now, I don't suggest that there's no fraud. Uh, it occurs. It's a big country. We've got a voting age uh, population of about 250 million or more. Uh, roughly 160 million people vote at some 130,000 polling state locations staffed by about three quarters of a million of part-time and volunteer workers. Of course, there's going to be some fraud. Similarly, it would be surprising if there was not some episodes of suppression, however one def defines that term. But both fraud and suppression are extremely rare in modern America. The Heritage Foundation Voter Fraud Database, for example, contains about 1,500 inc incidents of proven fraud since 2004. If we assume that for each of these confirmed instances, there are 20,000 incidents that have not been detected or otherwise are not included in the database, then we're left with a figure suggesting that fraud accounts to somewhere under, something under one-tenth of one percent of all ballots cast in that time. As to alleged vote suppression, suppression, it's simply obvious that voting has never been easier in the United States. Uh, no state had absentee, no fault absentee voting until it was adopted by California in the 1970s. Today, 35 states in the district do. Uh, the first state to adopt early in-person voting was Texas in the 1980s. Today, 46 states use it. Drop boxes and provisional voting are both post-1990 uh, creations. The Voting Rights Act dates all the way back to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 dates all the way back to 1965. Uh, the Motor Vehicle Act of 1992, the Help America Vote Act of 2002, both made voter registration easier. Many states have liberalized their laws in other ways. And we don't even think of other laws that deal with voting because we don't think of them as voting laws, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, which included provisions to enable, make sure that people with disabilities would be able to vote, and so on. So why is there this incredible lack of confidence in the uh, electoral process? Uh, I think a major problem is the constant tinkering with the process and the regular changes that are made. One reason isolated incidents of fraud are so readily, readily extrapolated by so many voters into believing that fraud is widespread or that on the other side suppression is widespread is that a lack of confidence in the fairness of the process often collapses into a lack of confidence in the honesty of the results determined under that process. And the fairness of the process in turn is brought into question when laws are continually in flux or challenged in litigation. Almost all the changes in the voting laws, even if defensible on their specific merits at that moment, uh, have the potentially partisan political consequences, and these consequences are 
often known in advance, or at least suspected in advance, and such partisanship is rarely out of the mind of legislators, executive officials, and even judges. This is not lost on voters, and late changes to the law in particular breed suspicion, and I think this makes people ready to assume the worst about election shenanigans. I see uh, these breaking down in three types, very broadly speaking. One, of course, is, uh, well, maybe we should say four. One is legislative changes uh, that seem to have a clear partisan edge. But to me, of greater concern are executive changes that are made late. These can be executive changes made by county election officials who decide uh, to accept ballots that they previously not, not, had not accepted or who decide to defy state law and say, you know, it's, we, we want to send back absentee ballots that aren't don't seem to have the right information on the outside envelope so that the voters can correct them uh, when there's no provision in state law to do this. And so some jurisdictions do it and some don't, and that can have a partisan effect if, depending on the jurisdictions doing it. You have state officials such as Michigan's Secretary of State taking it upon her to use COVID to flood the place with ballots, to send ballots to people who had not requested them, and a number of things that at a minimum I would hope all would agree are a stretch to the language of the statute, if not clearly contrary to the statute. Uh, but we also see this uh, in what I consider to be rash decisions by judges. In 2020, for example, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court just rewrote the statute repeatedly. Uh, and the argument in, in all of these cases is often made that people are not going to be able to vote if we don't make these changes. But when you're just changing the statute at the last minute, it's naturally going to raise people's suspicions about things. A final category I would raise is one that comes a little more uh, uh, deep, but I'll just touch on it briefly, and that goes to redistricting under the Voting Rights Act, and in particular the mixture between party and race. We know that African Americans tend to vote in very overwhelming numbers for Democratic Party candidates. The Supreme Court has for many years interpreted the Voting Rights Act uh, in a way that at least Justice Clarence Thomas and some others on the courts have felt is not at all intuitive to include redistricting and to guarantee uh, that uh, redistricting uh, serves certain seats for majority minority districts. And those districts will almost inherently be there for democratic districts. Uh, but parties are allowed to gerrymander districts for party advantage. The end result of this is that one party is allowed to make certain types of redistricting changes that the other party is not. The other party is not because if they gerrymander for partisan advantage when they hold control of things, then it has the potential to affect uh, the existence of these uh, majority minority districts and, and thus you, know, you have an asymmetry in what the parties can do in attempting to manipulate the districting process. I don't think that we can have that go on uh, for very long and have people be content with that. Um, generally speaking, then, I would just close by saying I believe that judges should be extremely careful about viewing uh, uh, voting behavior through the lens of any individual voter, considering the minuscule chance that one or a few votes will determine an election. One of the most damning things I have seen to voter confidence is when judges make decisions on election day to hold polls open, even though there have been no allegations of fraud or anything, it's just, oh, there's long lines or something. Uh, this leads people to tremendous amounts of, of suspicion that I think is problematic. I think judges need to be careful to give adequate weight not just to that right of individual voters, but to the societal interest in orderly and easily understood uh, voting processes. Um, and um, with that, I guess I would say that I, I think if we look at voting purely as a matter of individual rights in the same way we look at free speech or the same way we look at uh, uh, the freedom of religion or the right to be armed or a number of things like that, it simply doesn't add up. Voting takes place only within a government organized and regulated system of elections. And I believe that our judges and our elected uh, executive officials uh, need to uh, pay more attention to the idea of voting as a communal activity in which we govern ourselves, uh, and that that's the real impact and the importance of voting in the United States. Well, I too want to thank the Federalist Society for this invitation. Um, I know you guys like debate and conflict, and um, I will say I have many things I disagree with in Brad's recent remarks. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about what I was asked to talk about first, and maybe in the discussion uh, we can have some of that uh, disagreement played out. 
Um, so I was asked to talk about my concerns about the 2024 uh, elections. Uh, and I want to start by mentioning two background uh, elements about current American political culture that shape the specific concerns I have about the stability and acceptance of the 22 elect 2024 election process and its outcome. First, politics has come to be seen as existential by many people on both sides of the divide. And when politics becomes existential, people believe the country will never be the same if the other side wins. And about 70% of Republicans and Democrats said that essentially in a recent poll I looked at. Uh, and I'm not here to say they're wrong, but that perception uh, runs into the democratic kind of basic principle that uh, losers accept their losses because of the idea of rotation in office. I can accept losing today because I can win next time around. I can change policy down the road. When politics becomes existential, that idea kind of collapses, uh, or as I said, comes under tremendous pressure. I can't be satisfied by the idea my side can win next time around when I believe that victory by the other side will be catastrophic and changing the country in irreversible ways. And once people believe politics has become existential, they become more willing to justify to themselves and in public um, any means or other means that they would not normally justify that ensure the right outcome. And 25%, uh, I find this shocking if it's true, but again, looking at recent polling data, 25% of Americans say they believe quote, political violence may be necessary to save our country, a much higher number than you saw in previous studies. So that's the first kind of big idea about the nature of politics now. The second, uh, which has been alluded to a bit, is that elections now take place in a context of pervasive institutional distrust. All institutions have been pulled into the vortex of this hyperpolarized uh, existential kind of political culture. There's distrust of state legislatures when they enact voting policies on party line votes, as they almost always do, no matter which policies they're enacting, uh, more restrictive or more expansive. There's distrust of high level election administrators, such as secretaries of state, many of whom are elected on partisan tickets. And as Secretary of Adams said, I'm an ideologue, and so are some of my cohorts. Um, no other country, by the way, elects its top election administrators. I think this is a bad institutional design in the United States. I think we need independent election administration, but it's very hard to move in that direction. There's distrust of state Supreme Courts, many of them elected in increasingly partisan elections with tremendous amounts of spending. And we know there's distrust of the Supreme Court, um, at least uh, among independents and Democrats who give it their, the lowest approval ratings that Gallup has ever measured. So we're in a context in which there's really no institution that commands the kind of broad legitimacy that would allow contested election issues to be resolved in a way that would be widely accepted. Um, so with those broad considerations in mind, let me turn to some of the more specific things I'm worried about for 2024. One is that because of all these changes in laws that have taken place since 2020, uh, election administrators are going to be functioning under much greater legal uncertainty than would have been true about 10 years ago or so. Uh, it's already the case that many, many states, whether 2021, 2023, as Richard mentioned, have changed their laws, some more restrictive, some more expansive. And in the absence of settled practices about what these laws mean, we're going to be having novel interpretations and litigation uh, about these various laws. The second is many election officials are going to be running elections for the first time because since 2020, about a quarter to a third of our election officials throughout the country have quit because it has become a very unpleasant uh, task. They're under, um, some of them subjected to death threats, their families are threatened, harassment online. Uh, some states have enacted new laws to criminalize aspects of election administration. Um, and it's become a miserable job in many critical states to do. And mistakes, even good, good faith mistakes, are going to be perceived as motivated by partisan considerations. And in addition, you know, as Secretary of State Adams said, many more partisan activists have run for these lower level positions than in the past. Um, and we actually do have, uh, not at the highest levels of the system, but at county levels uh, and lower levels, 
people who have denied the legitimacy of the 2020 election who are now in positions to administer elections at the county and local level. We've already seen local officials in North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, New Mexico in 2022 who refused to certify election results based on groundless speculations of their own about something being wrong with the system. Uh, state courts in New Mexico, for example, had a mandamus a county to certify. Even when they did that, the vote was still only two to one to certify. And I worry that we're gonna see more of this from the inside of the system, now, not from the outside, but from within in 2024. 20, uh, Third, the social media environment is gonna be much worse in 2024 than it was in 2020. The platforms are gonna do far less to address election-related disinformation, like when you vote, what day you vote, conditions on you know, whether you have to, whether there'll be immigration officials at the polls and the like. Um, at X, formerly known as Twitter, you know, Elon Musk has basically gotten rid of the people who did election disinformation or other kinds of <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, moreover, as that <laughs> reaction indicates, <laughs> the whole issue of content moderation itself has become swept into the dynamics of partisan politics, partly due to some real mistakes that platforms made, partly due to perceptions of bias that might or, not, might or might not be accurate. Uh, so you see the laws in Texas and Florida that have been enacted now that the Supreme Court's going to look at this term. And as a result of how politicized the whole issue of content moderation has become, you're gonna have a flood of misinformation about the election process that is going to be sort of widely propagated without any kind of uh, moderation. When people are predisposed towards distrust as they are and social media is flooding the information environment with misinformation about what's happening, how are election officials like Michael Adams going to be able to counter that with you know, accurate information that reaches a large audience in, in real time. And I think this toxic mix uh, is really uh, dangerous for 2024. Now, I have a few suggestions um, that might mitigate a bit, um, but there are no great solutions to, to this toxic dynamic we're in. One is we do need clear rules specified in advance for the election, and I think courts have an important role to play here, and in particular, um, I think federal courts sometimes make a mistake of relying too heavily on doctrines like ripeness and mootness and the like to avoid deciding election issues until the very last minute, which is the worst possible time actually to decide the issues. So I think the U.S. Supreme Court was right in Moore versus Harper to find a way around the mootness of that case, and I think they had to strain some to do it in order to give us a clear resolution about the independent state legislature doctrine, which the system needed well in advance of 2024. So I applaud the court for finding a way around the mootness issues in that case. We need to get accurate results more quickly in the election process. It's, I think, a travesty that there are states that don't allow their election officials to process absentee ballots before the polls close on election night. Pennsylvania is the worst about this, but there are other states that are Why very are you bad. pointing at me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to respect and honor, you know, those of you from Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, we knew in advance of 2020 this was going to be a disaster, uh, and it was impossible to get the legislatures in Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania uh, to, to make this change. This doesn't mean counting the ballots, it just means getting them ready so that they can be instantly counted when polls close. Um, I think we need more consistency in statewide policies uh, on elections. We have, as Richard said, an incredibly decentralized system. Over 8,000 jurisdictions administer elections. Uh, we've lived with a lot of differences across counties in, a w in an age in which there was less distrust. I think where there's this level of distrust, to the extent secretaries of state or other officials can bring somewhat more consistency to policies across the state. That's a good thing. Now, there are real local differences, and sometimes those have to be respected, but I think we need to think harder about which ones to accept. Um, finally, uh, I would like to see us encourage people to vote in person 
Um, I wrote uh, in the run-up to 2020, the, the CNN, <laughs> but, okay, let me just say before you, I wonder why I keep getting invited back to the Federalist. <laughs> I feel like I must be doing something wrong. Um, uh, in the run-up to 2020, I, CNN titled this piece, Three Words to Avoid election, an Election Meltdown, which was vote in person. There's nothing wrong with absentee voting. Uh, I support absentee voting. I support no excuse absentee voting. But we know that voters make many more mistakes on absentee ballots. We know that they are a source of, of controversy. You know, we get into these fights about if the date was left off the ballot envelope, should it be counted or not? Does the signature match? There are a lot of, there's more complexity and suspicion and distrust and manipulation can prey on that greater complexity, and it can also slow down the, the counting process. Um, so I, I think in the pandemic, it made perfectly good sense we we're gonna have this level of absentee voting. Um, it won't be anywhere near as high as it was in 2020, but it will be higher than it was in the world before 2020. Um, but I, I do think voting in person reduces um, a lot of the, the issues uh, that create uh, potential controversy and problems. Um, Anyway, let me uh, stop there so I can take on Brad in the discussion. Thank you for those terrific presentations. Professor Pildes, there is good news from Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. We had an election on Tuesday, and there were about 100,000 mail-in ballots, and the polls closed at 8, and by about 8.15 or so, uh, they were pretty much all counted. So that was quite a different uh, situation from what we saw in the presidential election of 2020. If you go to the Allegheny County website, you will see what must have been a tortured effort by the poor folks that were laboring in the elections office to report over and over again every day exactly what was happening. But um, there seems to be improvement at least in one of the 67 counties of Pennsylvania. I can't speak for uh, Harrisburg. Do you want to? Was it the same there? I, I, I have. Uh, I do not have the same level of confidence. <laughs> in the counties there. Okay. Luzerne um, is the one with a lot of issues. Luzerne. Yeah. yeah. And also, I apologize to Professor Pildes. I should have warned you that you were walking to an audience full of people that have probably spent large uh, portions of their their recreational time reading the Twitter files. So. <laughs> <laughs> for not giving you heads That's up. why I come to these events. It's you know you, you learn things about how different people perceive the world. Uh, well, um, since you uh, you said you wanted to to uh, give a rejoinder to Professor Smith, why don't I let you start and then we'll we'll work backwards. Go ahead, Rick. Well, at a general level, I mean, I think a lot of you know Brad's concerns about changes at the last minute and the like come out of the pandemic election. I mean, th this is not. A, a general phenomenon, and uh, I think uh, under the conditions of the pandemic, I know there's lots of dispute about some of this, uh, but I think that um, actually the, the election administrators did a tremendous job under tremendous stress, where they had to both uh, be prepared for the level of absentee voting going from like 5% to 50%, as it did in some states, and also make the in-person polling places uh, safe. Um, and there was a lot of adjustments on the ground, I agree. Now, none of those led to people who were not eligible to vote, voting. It expanded the opportunity under the conditions of the pandemic for people who were otherwise eligible to vote. Uh, so uh, allowing drive up voting, for example, uh, keeping polls open later. And that's just one of the things I wanted to respond to with Brad. Courts have issued orders keeping polling places open past poll closing time forever. I mean, I've been involved in doing election related work for 30 some years. This is a very standard thing if there are reasons that, for example, the polls opened an hour and a half late because there's some sort of problem. You go to court, you get a court order that extends voting for an hour and a half. If people are in line at the time of poll closing, they're entitled to vote. That's that's a clearly established law. So I, I'm, I was really puzzled by Brad's concern about you know courts extending polling hours under these circumstances, which is a very, very common practice. 
Um, the Michigan Secretary of State, as I understand it, did not send out absentee ballots to everybody. She sent out absentee ballot applications, uh, which people had to return in order to get an absentee ballot and to vote absentee for what it's worth. Uh, on the redistricting, um, you know, you mentioned Justice Thomas view, Justice Thomas's view that the Voting Rights Act might not cover redistricting. This is, uh, and I, there, there are things I like about Justice Thomas, I want to say, so I don't mean this is, but this view that the Voting Rights Act doesn't apply to redistricting is completely, wildly implausible. The entire reason Congress amended the Voting Rights Act in 1982 was to deal with redistricting. You might dislike what they did, but there's zero doubt that the 1982 amendments to the Voting Rights Act were meant to apply uh, to redistricting. Uh, and uh, I've actually argued that there should be limits on both partisan and racial redistricting. Um, so that's one direction to go from uh, your comments. Um, but uh, to say one side you know, benefits from the Voting Rights Act because in the face of racially polarized voting, Congress has decided uh, there has to be an equal opportunity to elect candidates of choice and that's unfair in partisan terms. I mean, it's not an argument I've heard before. I guess I can kind of understand where that's coming from. Uh, but, you know, it is to deny the basic reason that the, the Voting Rights Act was enacted, which is to deal with racially polarized voting in contexts where minorities, being minorities, are systematically unable to elect their candidates of choice because in a state like Alabama, uh, they will never get elected from, or rarely get elected from majority white election districts despite being 27 some percent of the voting age population. So anyway, I don't know, I... I Let's give Brad a okay. chance. Yeah, to sorry. I <laughs> well, okay, so let me, let me say first, I, I'm not sure that there's some of the disagreements that Richard thinks there are. I mean, he's quite right that, that for example, courts have long held polls open, but as Richard said, like, if polls don't open on time, Right? And one of the things I mentioned was, you know, sometimes they're doing it for no reason other than there are long lines. But as Richard pointed out, if you're in line at closing time, you can vote. You may have to wait a while, but, but you can vote. And, you know, I, I think of other decisions that are made really simply because it's held that there are long lines. And therefore, maybe people were discouraged, so we'll hold the polls open. The, the extreme example of this was a case from Ohio a few years ago where uh, a, a judge was out at a dinner, much like this, only they were eating, you know, and her clerk <laughs> informed her that uh, she'd, uh, they'd gotten a call from somebody knowing that there had been a serious accident on the interstate north of Cincinnati, and this was making it hard for people to get to, to vote before the polls closed. Uh, and so she uh, ordered that the polls be held open from the dinner table, uh, uh, put on order ordering that the polls be held open longer. Um, the Court of Appeals did eventually overturn this decision after the election, um, had some uh, mootness problems. Of course, you don't get to it after the election, uh, or you don't get to it on election day, right? The, what's the law of election day? It's what you can find some judge somewhere to issue a decision on, because there ain't going to be time for no appeal. And that was the case here. So this federal judge orders the polls open, uh, and when it got to the Court of Appeals, Judge Sutton, in a wonderful opinion, he begins by saying, I don't even know what to call this case. And, and to be honest, I don't remember what the name of it is because they did finally call it something like INRI, you know, 2018 election or something <laughs> like that, 2000. Because it was, it was kind of like, you know, you can't, I, I mean, again, this is an extreme case. This isn't going to be the norm, but it's, it's illustrative of, of a direction you can go. You can't have, you can tell me otherwise, but I don't think you can have a judge say, get a call without a complaint, without a plaintiff even, and just say, well, gee, I, people are calling and saying there was a big accident, which there was, so we're going to hold the polls open. And, and I have seen that kind of thing for my entire life. Not that extreme, but pretty bad, as, Rich, as Richard says, Rick said. All, I, all our lives we've seen this, and I think this all our lives has contributed to decline in confidence in, in elections. Similarly, when we talk about the Voting Rights Act, and I sort of misspoke here, so I'm, I'm to blame for this, but partly it's the incredible time pressure uh, and so on. But I mean, it is true, the Voting Rights Act pretty clearly was amended in 1982 with an intent to make sure it applied to uh, redistricting. Uh, Justice Thomas's arguments has been that that essentially should be viewed as, uh, I think, unconstitutional, uh, and that it was also uh, erroneous uh, by the Supreme Court prior to that statutory change to have interpreted it that way. However it comes about, whether it's statute or, or judicial 
uh, I don't think it is sustainable to have a system in which we say one party can gerrymander and the other cannot. And the other cannot because when it gerrymanders to boost its electoral prospects, by definition, it is going to lower the electoral prospects of minority voters simply because those minority voters overwhelmingly vote for the opposition party. And this is done increasingly now when there's not that sort of evidence of polarized voting, or if the polarized voting is there, it comes much more from the minority groups which are voting overwhelmingly for one party. This is a thorny issue, this mixture of partisanship and race, but I, I just don't think it's sustainable to have that kind of system uh, where one party can justify its gerrymandering and the other party cannot because it's deemed to be not partisan but racial when in fact they're, they're sort of the, the same thing. So those would be a couple key things. And then I, if I can real quickly, I just want to say, I, I want to totally endorse uh, Rick's uh, endorsement of, of election day voting. I think this would be a marvelous help. And I think it's good for a lot of reasons um, that that should be the norm. I don't want to totally do away with absentee voting. I don't want to totally do away with early voting. I would like to trim those back and reestablish a norm that people vote on election day. It's good. It is a good thing to have to stand in line for a few minutes with your neighbors and fellow voters and other people and see that they're voting too. And they don't really look like that bad a guy. As Rick says, I think the Armageddon problem is a real one. And it's good, good for us to see that and kind of say, yeah, and, and, to, and to realize that the purpose of voting is not to sit in my kitchen table and think, how can I get the absolute most out of this election? but rather to sit with our neighbors and stuff and think what's the best way to get good policy for our body politic, for our polity. And I think in-day voting does that. It's also been shown to be one of the few things, as Rick pointed out, absent or absentee ballots are less likely to be counted. They're more likely to be fraudulent. I don't think either is a huge problem, but that's the reality of it. Um, but also I, th I think we, we want people to, uh, uh, think uh, about voting as, as sort of something that we do together to govern ourselves. And, and we're not just sitting at our kitchen table trying to think of how much we can get from it. So right. I, I'm totally I, right. Let me, let me, I'll thing, give Rick, Rick a brief rebuttal, then I'll, we're going to turn to our other uh, panelists. Well, I, I just want to clarify actually one thing. So I was not saying everyone should vote on election day. I talked about voting mm -hmm. in person. Right. And the reason I make Like that, Florida. Florida votes in person, but over an extended period right. of time. Right. The, one of the things that has changed is we have expanded early voting opportunities in many, many, many mm -hmm. states now. And so you can vote in person without having to worry about leaving work on Tuesday. You know, there are, mm -hmm. there's weekend days of early voting. So what I'm talking about is taking advantage of all the opportunities to vote in person not some idea that we should go back to a world in which the only way you can vote in person is on a single Tuesday, which is not a national holiday. And, right. and a go quick on. hit here is that there are some studies showing that people who vote in person have more confidence in election results than people who do not. Richard? Yeah. Uh, three things. One just on, on one on bread, uh, on the partisan aspects of election law change, there's actually very little evidence that they have partisan consequences. Uh, most of the, the data on uh, easier voting, easier voter registration, uh, changes in the voting mechanism make it easier show almost no partisan consequences. Uh, there's partisan motivation because different parties have different views about who's going to be benefited or harmed by election law changes, but almost all the academic studies suggest that it could be yes in a, in a, in a particular race where the, the margin is one or two or five, maybe it made a difference. But whether it's expansion, dealing with ex-felons, whether it's making it easier, making it harder, there may, there's, there's definitely partisan motivation. There's certainly this partisan valence in terms of who's passing what. There's very, very little evidence of partisan consequence. Um, uh, second, in terms of the loss of faith, like this does go back to the, when are, I, I was struck by the two incidents in the last election that had the most dramatic uh, fighting, case of loss of faith, case that they were, elections were being ruined, uh, Harris County, Texas, and Maricopa County, Arizona. In both cases, there were breakdowns in the election administration, uh, uh, problems with, pr uh, uh, with the printers, problems with late openings, problems with the machinery, which um, led to, of course, uh, charges of partisan <laughs> intent, which and led to also to, to lawsuits trying to keep the polls open longer. Uh, these were, again, the, 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 Clay, the um, Maricopa County, Harris County was run by Democrats, it was Republicans who were suing. Maricopa County actually had a Republican administrator, but it was also the, Carrie Lake who was suing. And so I do think in terms of what causes the loss of faith, going back to your point, people lose faith 
when the rules are being changed or when judges are stepping in. People lose faith when it doesn't work on election day. Uh, people, when they, when they are faced with long lines, when there aren't enough, uh, aren't enough election machines, when there aren't enough poll workers, that's when people lose faith. So if you want people to vote in person, we have to fund the system. And we have to make in particular that large urban and suburban areas with lots of voters have more machines, have working machines, have an up-to-date system. So I do think where people lose faith is when voting becomes in-person voting becomes difficult. And those were the two biggest fights that came out of 2022 <coughs> were Harris County, two, two of the biggest urban counties in the country. Um, and they're the ones who, where they had the most breakdowns, the most publicity, the most claims of fraud. Um, third, in terms of voting in person, I'm sympathetic, uh, otherwise to go with Rick's uh, amendment, which is we probably would have to make it a national holiday or make it 24 hours, because mm -hmm. people do work. Uh, if people do work at, or have children or have childcare obligations or have other kinds of care obligations and having short hours as some states do, not every state goes six to nine, some states have shorter hours, don't have longer hours in urban areas. Um, if we want to actually have everybody have more in-person voting, make it a national holiday, make it 24 hour voting. But even then, I think we're swimming upstream. COVID, was, COVID, I think, really, just as COVID changed the way people work, COVID changes the way people vote. And although 2022 has not nearly as much use of absentee voting as 2020, it was well above 2018. And something like 30% of all people are now consistently voting early in person. Mm -hmm. There's problems with early, because one of the real problems is, of course, last minute changes in the political environment. Candidates have been known to die uh, or have problems. And I, there is a problem with the early period about how long the period should be. But people are voting with their feet in, or voting with their hands in voting from home, voting by mail, and voting in person. So I think it's as much uh, a cultural thing, just as like people are basically prefer to do a lot of things out of the convenience of their homes. It may be a mistake, it may be bad for the culture, but you are swimming upstream. I do think that early in-person voting has some advantages. There are other problems with absentee voting or mail voting. But at the very least, if you want to encourage more people to vote in person, make it better, mm -hmm. uh, fund it better, uh, have, make sure there's better machinery, make mm -hmm. sure the, the places are better. Um, All right, uh, Richard, before I go to the Michaels, um, quick <coughs> question for you. Do you agree with Rick and Brad that in-person voting is preferable to mail-in voting provided that the in-person voting is not onerous, that it's relatively easy to do? Or do you still prefer or, or like mail-in ballot. I'm voting. not about preferring or like, I think it's about giving people choices. And we've, we're in a system where those choices exist. Well, and we don't I, give I, people choices about showing up for jury duty. And Rick, Rick made an important point about civic obligation, Brad, too, I think about civic duty, if civic obligation. If, if you have a, a duty to show up to jury service, it's not too much to ask to show up to vote, is it? Well, then we should make have mandatory voting, which we don't have as they have in Australia. Why don't we have mandatory voting and have people penalized for not voting? They do it in Australia. So you would favor mandatory vote? I would favor seriously looking at it. Maybe, may, I, it's, I haven't thought about it in any serious way, but I would be interested in finding out what the experience is in Australia where there is mandatory voting. Okay, all right, the Michaels. Well, thank you. A couple, couple of responses. Uh, I'm a realist and I get held responsible for how well this goes off or doesn't. And I can tell you this, when I, was sworn in three years ago. I inherited an election code that was written in 1891 at a time that we had a much more uh, robust uh, volunteer effort in Kentucky than we, that we have today. And it wasn't that hard to find uh, 4,000 people who would volunteer for a day to work the polls. It's harder today than it was in 1891 to find people with the free time who are willing to invest their free time and, and serve their community. And so uh, I, I'm a big believer in in-person voting. I think that's the gold standard for some of the reasons that have been uh, stated today. But I also think it's increasingly unrealistic to crowd millions of people in and out in one day uh, because I just don't have the infrastructure, at least in my state, as I was talking about in my remarks. I just don't have the facilities and I don't have the bodies. I don't have the volunteers. It takes, you know, we've got about 3,800 precincts and you do the math, it's about 15,000 poll workers to open every single one of them. And so that's why we're having to consolidate and other states are doing that too. Uh, so I'll, I'll confess something, I didn't push early voting through in, in my state uh, just because I'm a swell guy. I did it to make my job easier and the job of the county clerks easier because it's way easier to get people in and out over a four day period and smooth it out versus have one really, having one really chaotic day the last day. What if something goes wrong? What do you do? Uh, when you've got a little bit of lead in 
you can smooth out that turnout a little bit. It's just easier to get folks in and out. It's, I mean, it's kind of crazy to have a, a, a task of the government that you just do in one day. If the DMV were open one day, we'd be pretty upset about it. I think the election system should be open for more than one day. Uh, where I digress from a lot of folks in my, in my job in other states is I don't like election month. I think that distorts the outcome of who wins elections. And I'll give you my, my personal example. Uh, I ran against a former Miss America who was very well known, very high name ID, very well funded, and I was kind of a nobody. And then uh, we had the election and I won. But if, those, if votes had been cast early, a month early and banked, I never would have had a shot. Uh, and I can give you plenty of other examples uh, on the other side where Democrats uh, or, or Republicans or both uh, were disserved by those rules. I, I don't like the election month model where you you basically have a lot of votes cast before folks are informed, before they've seen the debates, before they've seen the ads and all of that, before they talk to their neighbors. Uh, I think what we found in Kentucky is, is a good, at least for my state, uh, a good approach of having more days, but not so many that you begin to uh, distort the outcome of the election. Uh, you know, to segue a little bit about uh, Kentucky again, uh, this won't work everywhere because most states you have uh, one party control the legislature and the governor, so it was somewhat of, a, I guess, a happy coincidence in a Kentucky, in my term, uh, we didn't, we had split control. But I think the number one way to have public confidence in your elections and not have one side thinking that you're trying to rig the rules, uh, if, if you do give the appearance, whether you're Democrats pushing mail-in voting in Vermont or you're uh, Republicans in Georgia, I, I think unfairly uh, called vote suppressors for dialing back, I think, seven or eight weeks of early voting to only five or whatever it was. Uh, at least in Kentucky, when you've got the advantage of, of split control politically, what I tried to do, and I, I think was successful at, is trying to find things both sides could agree on, expanding early voting a little bit, uh, cracking down on the security side, but doing it in a responsible way that was humane, and giving both sides something. And so uh, Kentucky, I think, is one of the unique places where we've had Democrats and Republicans together passing election laws in a bipartisan fashion, expanding access while also tightening security. And then when folks lose elections, uh, they don't allege that something was wrong. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Democrats lost the U.S. Senate race despite outspending Senator McConnell, I think 100 million to 30 million, and they accepted the results. Uh, they accepted that they lost. Uh, this week, uh, Daniel Cameron, Ran, uh, for governor of Kentucky, was tied in the polls to the very end. I thought he was going to win, and, and he didn't. And he went on stage and conceded. And that was, uh, I shouldn't have to remark that that is an impressive thing, but in today's <laughs> politics it is. Uh, so, uh, again, I think that's somewhat unique to Kentucky that we've, we've pushed this off. We haven't played politics with it. We've done it in a bipartisan way. I think the result is public acceptance. Great. Uh, just a, a program note, we're going to go till about 4.40 or 4.45 since we started late. And in about five minutes, I'll invite folks to the mic. Uh, Professor Domino. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I guess I'll start with the, uh, the early vo voting point since uh, everybody else mentioned that. Um, I, I generally agree with Mike that, the, that some small period of, of early voting is a good idea. We have in Pennsylvania about a month uh, to vote by mail, and uh, one consequence of uh, of that in the last cycle was that there was a, a debate for the U.S. Senate race that was held after thousands of people had voted already, um, and at that debate it became clear that one of the candidates uh, was suffering from a condition that many people might have considered to be an important consideration when casting their votes, but uh, a good number of the votes had been cast already. So I think that there is a, uh, a substantial interest in not uh, having that early voting period, whether in person or by mail, go, go on for too long. Um, but on this, this question generally of, of how to structure elections that way, there is a, uh, a fundamental question of what is it that we want? Should we change a, a policy to have one kind of rule or another based on what goal. Uh, and there is no agreement on that point among the, the citizens of the country or uh, among any other subset of it. Do we want to encourage people to vote? Do we want to make it as easy as possible to vote? Well, some people do and other people don't. Do we want to try to achieve the 
uh, results that make sense in some kind of way? Do we want to choose the best leaders? Well, of course, we can't agree on, on what those are, uh, even if we could agree that that's a, a good goal and so on. So whether we have, you know, with this early voting in particular, would uh, I think Richard is, is absolutely right that there, there are a ton of people who now want to shop online, want to vote online, want to do everything online and, and not have to put on uh, any pair of pants other than pajamas. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, you know, that's a, a fact of modern life. So if we want to encourage as many people as possible to vote, that's the kind of thing we're going to do, but we have to uh, realize that there's a kind of, of trade-off. Uh, and speaking of trade-offs, I, I, um, I, it strikes me in listening to, to all the very great remarks by, by everybody else on the panel that there are a couple of different things we could be talking about in terms of this question about public confidence in elections. The, the first one is how to increase public confidence in elections, again, assuming that that's what we want to do. And, and I agree that there are some methods for doing that if you're lucky enough to be in a, a situation where, as, as Mike was describing, where you have kind of buy-in by Democratic and Republican leaders, I think that can advance things. Certainly having election regulations and statutes that are relatively clear rather than very open-ended uh, advances things. The more that you have an open-ended law applied by a potentially uh, a, a partisan motivated election official or judge or whatever, I think that's asking for, for more trouble. But in general, I am a little bit more pessimistic than some others about the prospect of improving public confidence in elections. I, I think, as uh, another one of my co-panelists was suggesting, that uh, the public distrusts legislatures with justification. The public distrusts election administrators with some justification. The public distrusts judges with some justification, sitting between an election administrator and a judge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and independent commissions, which are often trotted out as the solution to this, public distrusts the independence of independent commissions too. Um, and, and what's more, they're probably right to do so. So uh, if you're as pessimistic as I am, you wonder not uh, how are we going to make the public confident in the results of elections, but recognizing that the public isn't going to be confident in elections, then what do we do? Do we just say, you know, here's how, one group avoids taking the blame uh, for, for problems, um, or, or do we do something else? Right, well, put me in the category of favoring clear, clear laws, so it makes my job easier. Uh, questions, not comments or speeches, please, sir. Yeah. Hi, Russ Nobile. I'm one of the uh, uh, election team at Judicial Watch. Very much enjoy the panel. It's nice to see both friends and our defendants on the panel. So uh, uh, thank you. Uh, one fairness issue that did not come up in the panel uh, was a question in 2020 about candidate standing. For over 100 plus years, candidates had standing to litigate questions about the time, place, and manner regulations uh, uh, of their elections. And in 2020, that window closed, and now courts are trying to deal with that. I uh, wanted to get anybody on the panel's thoughts on the new standing rules. Thank you. Can you pass? Anybody want to take that? Is that true? I think we're at a wash. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, we might have to have more specifics because I'm not sure what you're referring yeah, to. <laughs> well, uh, there wasn't any lack of litigation. Yeah. Well, uh, so, in so, several of the campaigns, uh, Trump's campaign's litigation questions, were dismissed for lack of standing. The election day litigation, they litigated the uh, legislator thereof or the independent legislative doctrine. As we all know, that is a question that the court heard two years later. He was bounced out when he raised that question during the course of the litigation. And so many of the cases were dismissed because, not because of Purcell or other things, but because they just said you don't have standing. Uh, and for over 100 and some odd years, candidates always had standing. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the most prominent cases came from the Third Circuit, which was the Bonnier decision that bounced uh, 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 an entire line of cases on standing questions. Uh, it may not be something y'all have encountered. Yeah, no, uh, if you're referring to, I'm not sure, if you're referring to the, the, the principle the Supreme Court established earlier on that only legislatures have standing to challenge a violation of their authority to uh, 
act under uh, uh, the, 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 oh. the Second Amendment. Article, uh, the, two. Article two. No, I'm not talking, yeah, on Article two, yes. If you're talking about that, that was the Supreme Court doctrine that had been established a while earlier. I'm not sure I agree with the doctrine, but the doctrine had been established that it's the legislature that this provision protects, and therefore the legislature is the only entity that has the standing. Thank you. Uh, Jim Young, National Right to Work Foundation uh, staff attorney. In my civilian life, uh, about 10 years back, I served as chairman of a task force in Prince William County, one of our bellwether counties here in Virginia, uh, regarding some difficulties we had with the election. We recommended many of the changes uh, that have been made, including uh, excuse-free early voting. My question is, hasn't it gotten away, to, to, and I, I pr believe Professor Domino touched on this, uh, haven't we gotten away and, and perhaps too far from the notion of elections as a process uh, by which varying candidates make their arguments, uh, the, a back and forth, and the notion of a final argument made on that first weekend in November, to the degree that with early voting, what we have is either partisans who've made up their mind and they won't be changed under any circumstances, or ignorant voters who are going to uh, check whatever the last name they heard is. And I don't see how that that is, uh, serves the republic at all, let alone uh, an, the notion of an informed electorate. Anybody want to comment on that? I'll, I'll say only that the, uh, the, I'm always kind of conflicted with questions like that because I, I do think that there has been some shift at least in, in emphasis or the way that we talk about those kinds of things, but I'm less sure that there is a shift in actual practice. That is, if, has it always been the case that uh, large numbers of people would vote for the, know a year in advance who they're going to vote for? It was, my sense is that maybe the numbers have increased as we've become more partisan. Uh, over the last couple of decades, but uh, I, I am sure that uh, a whole bunch of Democrats knew they were going to vote for Adlai Stevenson and a whole bunch of Republicans knew they were going to vote for Dwight Eisenhower uh, 70 years ago. I, w I want to ad address that just real quickly, though, oh, and part on Mike, Michael's comment there. I mean, one of the reasons, and, and by the way, I, you know, I know, I did not say we should not have absentee voting or that we should not have early voting. I think we should have them more limited and it should be expected that the norm is that you vote on election day. Uh, that that's the norm that we try to live to. Uh, and and I, we talk more about that. And I think early voting should be cut way back and I think there's, there's very strong polling evidence that the, that the public doesn't think you need more than about two weeks of early voting max and, and many states have much more than that. But this brings up a point that's often overlooked which is in small races in the country, township trustee, village council, the county commissioners in rural areas, right? You have people, they start campaigning on October 20th. You know, they don't do anything before then because they're spending 600 bucks on their campaign <laughs> and doing a couple mailers. And what happens with, all, they go around, start knocking on doors in their little village and all these people have already voted. And a lot of these elections are nonpartisan. People would, you know, very different from those national elections where people maybe are more certain way in advance how they want to vote. And, and I think that's one more reason that I think early voting is ultimately kind of corrosive of our democracy, at least when early voting is extended way out. I agree with like the secretary. You know, a few days helps administratively, and I think as Rick and, and Richard point out, it allows people who otherwise might not be able to make it to the polls to get there, but I, the idea that you need, you know, a month or more of early voting strikes me as absurd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Garrett Hoff, Vice President of Speakers for the Duke Law Chapter. Uh, do you think ranked choice voting advantages voters that are able to take the time to form opinions on an entire field of candidates as opposed to more casual voters? And for this or any other reason, does ranked choice voting violate your conceptions of fairness in the electoral process? No. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence in places that have adopted ranked choice voting that voters very quickly figure it out. Turnout remains high. Depends on how many choices that they're given. They may not take all the choices. But I think there's evidence there in San Francisco and Oakland, in New York, and all, many places. It takes about one round of education uh, to make sure that people understand what they're doing. 
And it really is up to them. I mean, I, I think New York, we have too many choices. It's down to five. But I think three would be, I mean, I think people can figure it out. Um, and in some sense, it's consistent with the, uh, 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 Judge Hardiman's uh, concept earlier or the other people on the panel about the duty people to figure things out. But I think most people do. And certainly there may be one first election where it takes a little bit of education, but by the second election, the turnout is high and, and um, or, or certainly not reduced. Uh, and there's no evidence that it changes the composition of the electorate. So I think the short answer is no. Would you add, Richard, that it adds to sort of the civic um, engagement in the sense that you're not as likely to focus on tribe or past um, habit because you have to actually investigate more? Uh, there's some of that. I mean, you do have to learn a little bit more. Um, I think the major argument, and I think you know, the jury is still out on this, frankly, is that it can affect campaigning in that candidates may be also campaigning for second votes. Mm -hmm. And so that it may make campaigns a little less hostile. Uh, that vote for me, but I know you're committed to so-and-so, vote for me second. Uh, and so it also, I think, deals with the spoiler problem. Uh, I really, really want for, to vote for somebody who is on one end of the, one extreme, pick your extreme. That person's, either that person's not gonna win so I won't vote for that person or I will vote for that person. As a result, my second choice loses. With ranked choice voting, you get to, you get to put in both. Um, so again, um, the, we've only had a, a, few, a few cycles of it in many places. Uh, there's some evidence that it makes voters somewhat happier. Can I there's add no one other people drop important, out. important thing yeah. about ranked choice voting? You know, in our standard plurality voting system, yeah. uh, you know, very yeah. factional candidates can get elected if you have a field of a number of candidates. You know, 35% of the vote may be enough for you to get elected, particularly in primary elections. And so one of the major justifications for ranked choice voting is it makes it more likely that the candidate who a majority of the electorate supports will actually be the candidate who's chosen. Because once you go through that, you know, vote redistribution process, um, you have to have a majority of the votes at the end of the day in order to, uh, to get elected. I, it, I think it is, Richard mentioned this, I think it's strange that the Re Republican Party has become hostile yeah. right now to ranked choice voting, not completely. The Virginia GOP used it in yeah. its convention mm -hmm. to choose its nominee yeah. for governor who became Glenn Youngkin yeah. Yeah. Um, because they thought it would allow, it would get them to a more electable candidate. And since the Republican Party right now is more internally divided, that the party actually has, I think, a self-interest actually, um, especially in primary elections, um, in using ranked choice voting because it's going to uh, avoid more factional candidates who have less chance of winning the general election getting chosen. But because the Democrats have won the first few of these, it's- Or, it's, or a moderate Republican. Or a moderate Republican, Republican. Yeah. I, th I think. Yeah. Um, Right now, an ideology has settled in among the Republican Party you know, against it, but I, I think that's probably not in the interest of the party. Uh, ben Sliska, visiting from Seattle. I've got my smartphone here, and I can send $10,000 to any one of you if you give me your mobile number. And uh, um, mine we, is um, <laughs> okay. Very good. Don't then. lose that phone. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, so the, this is a technology question. Obviously, um, uh, you know, dead voters, uh, you know, voter fraud. Uh, ballot harvesting, all of these kinds of things, you know, if, if, so the question is, could you do a technology solution? Do you think there's a trustworthy way to do that? I wrote my first software 47 years ago, warning. Um, is there a technology solution that might solve a lot of these problems, inc including increasing voter trust? At the moment, there isn't. There's been a lot of studies about, in effect, um, truly voting from home, voting electronically. If you can do your banking from home, why can't you do your voting? Uh, the people at MIT and other people who said it, no one is remotely confident enough that, they have a, that there's an unhackable system. Mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about voter distrust of outcomes now because uh, the late Hugo Chavez program of Dominion Machines before he died, the level mm -hmm. of voter lack of confidence, and I think the lack of confidence of the people who design these machines, people working on it, is so great where maybe we might get there, but we are not close to getting there now. And I mean, the, the, the problem of error we, there are obviously there are errors in the banking system. There are er other errors, but these these could be irreversible errors okay. and, and undetectable yep. errors. So and right now, quickly. nobody is confident enough to, to want to go forward. So just real quick, uh, believe it or not, we actually have had internet voting in the United States. Washington State had it back 
in the 2008 election for a governor, which I, I was involved in, it was a nightmare. <laughs> and they repealed it. And they went to drop boxes because the, trust, the public trusted Dropbox voting more than they trusted the internet. Hi there, uh, John Giocaris from the Chicago Lawyers Chapter. Um, are we all in agreement that uh, election administration is strictly a state responsibility? Or does Congress have the constitutional authority to nationalize all electoral law and procedure as the prior Congress attempted to do with the so-called For the People Act? Well, constitutionally, there's no, there's no question that Congress has the power uh, to regulate uh, House and Senate elections. The Supreme Court has said, you know, Congress can write a complete code of elections for federal elections under the elections clause. It hasn't used that power very often. Um, and there are, you know, political issues about, are, are we better off with a decentralized system? Should we nationalize certain issues of, of, about the process more? But just as a matter of, of constitutional power, at least for House and Senate elections, there's no dispute that Congress could do all of those things. Okay. Uh, prefacing the question with a, with a quick State of the Union in Pennsylvania, at least from my understanding from um, uh, Congressman uh, or re State Representative, now, now retired, uh, uh, Frank Ryan. But um, in Pennsylvania, the, the uh, governmental data security practices around election, uh, elections and election data um, do not follow sort of private sector standards and do not submit to regular uh, security, uh, data security auditing practices that are common in the private sector. For example, if you run a bank or a credit card company, the private sector security standards applicable there are much higher than what Pennsylvania will submit itself to. I wonder what the state of the union is across the country, if anyone can comment on, are there similar problems in other states where uh, private, where the government uh, run uh, data security uh, for elections is resistant to following the highest standards sh uh, available in the private sector, uh, and, and if you see any solution to that problem to help improve Secretary, voter confidence in elections. Well, ours is very robust. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a good one, and you're not going to give us the code. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So when it comes to the idea of fairness in elections, I think that there's two uh, sorts of ideas that uh, some of you have alluded to so far. I think the first Richard definitely alluded to it when he uh, opened. Um, and the first idea that I've understood is that there's this like procedural fairness, right? And that's where it's like how the laws on the ground actually operate when people go to vote and how restrictive or not restrictive they are. But then the other type of fairness seems to me to be uh, more substantive or I'll call it practical fairness. And that's kind of like what we haven't really like, uh, I think dove into yet. But I think how that, or I think what embodies that is really like the idea that there are things going on in the background of our political uh, atmosphere that kind of influence how people vote. And based off how that influence is carried out, it can be unfair to a particular party if you know people are being influenced in one way or another. I think to that uh, uh, substantive or practical form of fairness, there's this discussion that's very lively right now about how fair it is when you have, uh, let's say, legacy media or you have social media or you have tech companies that are kind of like putting a thumb on the scale. Um, and that question is weighing heavy on my mind right now because I'm thinking about the 2022 midterm election when we had a whole bevy of states adopting these voter laws that many uh, particularly Democratic politicians kind of weighed in on and said that it was suppressive. Um, I think the Biden administration even characterized the specific voting laws in Georgia as being uh, Jim Crow 2.0. And I believe that that was pretty much to suggest that it was gonna make it harder for African Americans to vote or pose obstacles, whatever the case may be. What actually turned out was the uh, turned out being the case once the dust settled and the research came out was that 96.2% of black voters reported their voting experience was excellent or good. 91% of blacks said voting was easier or no difference than the previous election cycle. 93% of blacks said voting was easier or no difference, and 0% of blacks reported a poor experience. And this is in relative relation to like equal numbers to whites. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is that there was a great degree of misinformation that was spread about what the election was going to, how the election was going to turn out. My question is probably best directed to the FEC or former FEC chair in asking what can be done to balance the fact that we have to rein in misinformation that can influence elections um, with the imperative to make sure that we're not undercutting free speech. Because I think it's absolute travesty when you have Democrat politicians or anybody predicting that election is going to turn out in a way that's 
Jim Crow 2.0 and then you see something so far from it. Um, but I also think that there's a, obviously an imperative to balance free speech rights. So long-winded question, but essentially how can we do that? Well, it seems that usually what we hear is people complaining about things that are deemed to be misinformation that turn out to be true that would have benefited Republicans. That's been a big issue lately. One of the most classic, of course, the Hunter Biden laptop. As I understand your question, you're sort of suggesting we get all this misinformation about how awful the Georgia Code was when they amended it, right. and there's really no evidence that it's that awful. And I guess that goes to show that, that you can have a lot of misinformation come from all kinds of, of directions. Uh, you know, we just had a, an election in Ohio in which, you know, in my view, one side's campaign was just entirely built on lies from, from the moment they started. And did they tell the truth once? In my view, no. Uh, but can you restrict that? You know, I, I think the danger comes when you start to have government try to decide that it knows what is the real stuff. And not just, you know, the mis this misinformation, they build it off this idea like somebody saying, well, the polls are only open in Kentucky until, or, or they're open in Kentucky until 10 p.m., so you don't have to hurry out and vote, right? And they direct that and fool people into not voting. But that doesn't really much happen. The problem is just this bigger stuff that we disagree on, whether something's relevant or not, how likely it is to be true. And, and I don't know if there's a legal solution for that, because I do think, or I guess I would put it this way, I think any effort at most legal solutions is probably more harmful than, than the disease. You've got to let people speak and, and ask journalists to be more responsible, ask campaigns to be more responsible, you know, but how much you can do, I don't know. All right, uh, stopwatch, one minute to I get a question and answer. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Mike Isaac from Tampa, Florida. Um, the paradigm, I think, is changing. Voters are um, uh, frustrated and there's a, a level of distrust and, and we see a greater number changing from partisan registration to independent. In fact, six months ago in Hillsborough County, there were more registered independents than there were Republicans. That's not the case today. But I, I'm just wondering, to what extent do you think this change in the paradigm is affecting the outcomes in the primaries which are closed, and perhaps this change in the paradigm, does it require reevaluation as to whether the primaries should be open? Can I? You, you want to go? Uh, we got 20 seconds oh, can I, <laughs> to answer a really can I, complicated and good question. Can I, can I take that? So in, in my state, we have closed primaries. So we don't let independents vote. Uh, independents are the fastest growing voter block in our state. We've actually had months this year where we had more registered independents register than Republicans and Democrats combined. And there's right. no independent party doing registration drives. That's huge. Uh, I think it's good uh, if we were to open those primaries because we have very low turnout in our primaries. It was 14.5% uh, in this May. That disenfranchises a lot of people who are taxpayers who ought to get to vote. It also leads to very extreme outcomes for only the most zealous right-wing and left-wing people vote in the primary and everyone else is left out. That's, please exactly, join that's exactly the point that I was, I was trying to illustrate. Thank, all right, please join me in thanking our experts. All right. All right. Union. No. <laughs>